Well, this is Edward Bevilacqua from the Italian American Club and Ciao Tutti Magazine. And today is Veterans Day here in Las Vegas. Well, I guess it's Veterans Day everywhere. In the right? United States, yeah. yes. So I had uh, the good fortune to be able to uh, sit down with attorney and entertainer Nick Mastrangelo. Nick, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. It's my pleasure to be here. And so um, I'll just jump right into it. Your Italian roots. It's on my the paternal side, mm -hmm. and uh, the family is originates from Abruzzo. Okay. And Did you ever say Abruzzi? Abruzzi is kind of an antiquated term. Yeah. Abruzzi comes from the time period when both Abruzzo and Molise were linked together wow. in the same in the same okay. region. And then they actually separated. And was that when around the 20th century sometime? Yeah, that was I think the early 20th century. Because my grandmother always said she's, and grandparents both said they're from Abruzzi. Yes. They didn't say Abruzzi. Yes, yes. You, it's, it, you hear it both ways. But actually modern, the modern usage is Abruzzo mm -hmm. because it defines that particular region Got it. as distinguished from Molise. Okay, now, do you consider Abruzzo central Italy or northern southern Italy? I would say that historically it's linked to to Naples. To the south. Yes, so it would be probably, geographically, it's central. Right. But as and far it's as... Just, it's really pretty much east of Rome. Yes. As far as custom and culture, um, it kind of straddles both. It, it, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, common uh, cultural uh, things that that take place that in 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 northern part of Abruzzo mm -hmm. that are linked to like Umbria okay. and Le Marche, and um, also there's other other parts of Abruzzo that that seem a little more linked to Naples. Okay. Um, it, so I'm going to say it's central. Do you usually say southern Italy or central? If people say, well, where is it? I say I, I kind of describe it in reference to Rome. Okay. If you east tell people, because everybody knows where Rome yeah. is. Okay. So you say it's it's due east of Rome, okay. and you're in Abruzzo. Okay. Now, if a Sicilian said, or somebody from southern Italy. Would you claim that, well, I'm Southern Italian too? Would I say that? Yeah. Mm, I would say that I'm a Bruzzese. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and that says everything. And they That's know. You need to say. And they know. Okay. Somebody from Sicily will know immediately uh, you know, what that entails mm -hmm. and what region that is. Okay, perfect. So your grandfather was from there, a little town up in the mountains. Called Bomba. Bomba. And I again, I, I'm positive I've seen that. I think I have a picture of a highway sign that says, "Like exit for Bomba." That is Bomba. Okay, that looks like uh, Torre di Nolfe. It's actually larger than the town my grandfather's from, but it, it's on the side of a hill like that. Yeah. And they had, uh, I think, uh, might have been wheat fields or something down below. Mm -hmm. Some some kind of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Those pictures, the two on the side over there. Uh huh. Are both from the town from Bomba. Okay, and it looks like Torre de Nolfe. So it's an old town, very old town. Yeah. As a matter of fact, some parts of it, because it's built on the side of a of a mountain, mm -hmm. the older parts are crumbling. Yeah. And that's happening in some very yeah. beautiful historic towns in Italy. Are are, are that's sure. happening to them? Yeah. Okay, so your your grandfather came over, 20th century. Yes. Okay. When he was what teenager? Older? He was he was eighteen. Okay. And um, he the story goes that he he rode on a donkey hmm. uh, all the way to Naples. And wow. That's, that's where he got the boat. Wow. Now, what's your other half? The other half is would would be Dutch and Scottish. Okay. Is that where you got your blue eyes? Do you think? My grandfather had blue eyes. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of people with blue eyes in, in Abruzzo. And, yeah. And, and, uh, Did it, your dad have blue eyes? He had green eyes. Okay. 
Okay, my dad has green eyes. <laughs> <laughs> my mom did have the blue eyes. I see. My mom had blue eyes. Okay, okay. So, what did your dad do? Well, um, apart from his his uh, military service, he worked for Ford Motor Company huh. because we were living in Detroit, and uh, and that's that was a big employer, still is, but it was even bigger at that time. Sure. Oh yeah, it was much as a percentage, I guess, a lot more. Yes. Yes. He worked for Ford Motor Company. Building cars. Yes, and he was in, in, in parts. He, oh. he was in, in charge of um, parts for uh, Ford Division, they called it, mm. which was basically the management side, the executive side. I see. Okay. And that was, and where did you go to school? I went to school in Detroit, mm -hmm. went to Henry Ford High School. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I went to Michigan. Mm hmm and I went to, uh, after Michigan, um, I went to a law school that is now part of Michigan State. Oh, yes, so that pennant there? Well, that's Michigan. That's oh, when, I thought, that's I when thought they it won. said Michigan State. Okay, yeah, yeah. Michigan. Right. Yeah, it, okay. I, I do get conflicted sometimes when I watch. You know, <laughs> oh, Michigan is green. Yeah, right? Michigan is green, and, and Mich uh, Michigan's, Michigan State is green. Michigan is blue. Michigan State is green. Yeah, Michigan yeah, State. That's what I meant. That's I guess I get. So where did which school did Steve Garvey go to school? I think he went to Michigan State. Steve Garvey, baseball player. Yeah. Dodgers. Yeah. I think he went to Michigan State. Uh, does Michigan State play USC, or did they? Not on a regular basis. Okay. He played besides baseball. He played football. He's a defensive back, and he said he played a game against OJ. Oh, okay. He wasn't able to stop him. He had so no impact. In USC, yeah. Yeah. So would he? I, would that have been Michigan or Michigan State? Do you think? I don't know. That would probably. That might have been Michigan because, you know, on on occasion they would both play mm, USC, but they're in different, uh, uh, they're in different divisions. So okay. Or different, different. Um, the Big Ten, Michigan, and Michigan State are in the Big Ten, and, and of course. Right. USC is not. Yeah, USC is Pac-10, pac I think. Okay. So did you ever think about working at Kellogg's? No. Aren't they in Michigan? They are in Michigan. They're in Battle Creek, I think. Yeah, I have a friend whose daughter went to Michigan, and internships during their summer junior year mm -hmm. was a big thing. And I guess uh, Kellogg's was a big thing. A lot of people wanted to go work at Kellogg. Yeah. I, I worked a little bit for Ford Motor Company when I was in school, and uh, uh, I did various other things. But they were all, you know, in Detroit, in the Detroit area. Now, when did you decide you wanted to get a law degree, become a lawyer? I think it was midway through my undergraduate studies, which was in at, what? at Michigan. Um, I changed my major several times, but I ended up majoring in political science. So was it political science, then law, or law, and then political science? Well, it was political science, and then... I mean, you, is I, that when you got interested because of political science and going to law school? I think that I had it in the back of my mind that I might want to be a lawyer. Okay. And so I was thinking about, well, should I change my major, and if so, what major is mm -hmm. it would be the best? And uh, of course, there, there are a lot of attorneys that had degrees in in English. Yeah, a lot of guys. Like and and, and some of them had it in history. Yeah. And some of them had it in uh, in uh, um, psychology. Huh. Um, but I think for the most part, I think the majority would would probably be uh, political science majors. Okay. Now, what about singing? Well, um, there was always music in my house. Okay. And growing up, I, I just... Like somebody played the accordion? No, somebody played Frank Sinatra records. Oh, okay. <laughs> everybody sang along. <laughs> yes, and because uh, my parents were big fans. And... Uh, Did you have uh, cousins there too? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so it wasn't just your dad or your grandfather, dad... 
in Detroit, it was... Oh, I had uncles and, and, yeah. and cousins. Okay. So okay. the typical, a bunch of people went to the same area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so you have holidays and... Okay. Did anybody, nobody had an accordion though? No. Okay. We had one uncle that would always bring his accordion. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, it, actually, the, apart from listening mm -hmm. and dancing, which my parents did a lot of, um, it, it it seems to me that the family was not that musical. Oh. Huh. And uh, but but I had it in my ears I from a very that. young age. And that was a time that Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Perry Como, Tony Bennett, yes, Sergio Franchi. Oh yeah. All of those guys were very popular. Yes. Yes. So it, you wouldn't have to go far. To listen to no, you wouldn't. And um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Abruzzo is famous for singers because okay, who are some of them? Perry Como's family okay originated okay. In, in Abruzzo. Dean Martin I knew that and uh, Mario Lanza okay, I think I knew that too. I think I forgot that and uh, well, he's not a singer, but uh, Henry Mancini. Um, his family also originated in Abruzzo. Wow. Okay. That's a, you know, I think proportionally with because the population isn't so great in Abruzzo, right? No, it's it's not. It, it's one of the. So the, when you have so, that many people, that is a high, a disproportionate amount. Well, of world certainly class. of of yeah, world class famous yeah. Yeah. singers. Yes. So do you think it's genetic then? I don't know. It's but in the water. I, I don't know what, but my my dad kind of looked like Perry Como, hmm. and Perry Como's the town that he came from. Uh, it's I believe it was Palena, which is near Sulmona. Okay. And Palena is kind of in between Bomba and Sulmona. Okay. So I don't know. There may be something there too. Okay. <laughs> so did your family encourage it? You're singing. Did you sing as a as when no. you were young? No. Oh, you didn't sing. No. When well, when did you first sing? And we'll work our way back. I started singing about I would say about 14, 15 years ago, and I I wasn't on my radar. I was focused on the law, and I was focused upon my family and and uh, and making a living and, mm -hmm. and and taking care of them, and uh, about 14 or 15 years ago. But but the music was always in me. I, okay. I knew that. And so you drive around listening to Frank Sinatra, etc. I would go. Well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay. I, I got to meet Frank Frank Sinatra and and uh, actually became acquainted with him. Hmm. Um, but it was before I thought of being a singer. Okay. It it just by uh, a quirk of fate I got to meet him. Um, when I was, well, I might as well tell you right now. I, mm -hmm. I uh, when I was in the district attorney's office here, yes, here, um, I was a prosecutor, and in that job, you get to meet the heads of security oh, in sure. the different hotels, and I became friends with the head of security at uh, Caesar's Palace. Nice man uh, named Jack Mattis, mm -hmm. and. He called me up one day, and he said, uh, "Hey Nick, would you like to meet Frank Sinatra?" And you're I, sitting at work. I'm right? sitting at work, and, and, and I thought, you know, he's playing a joke on me. So I said, uh, you know, I said, Jack, don't do that. That's that's not funny. That's a cruel <laughs> joke because you know he's a big part of my 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 youth. Mm. And um, he said, "No, no, no. Just come on down. Um, I'm going to introduce you to him." So. I went down and I met him, and we chat, chatted for a while. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the conversation, he said to me, he said, are you married? I said, yes, I am. And he said, why don't you bring your wife down tomorrow night to see the show? Wow. So that following evening, I told my wife, we're going to go down to Caesar's Palace. Let's get out a little bit, you know, and mm -hmm. get the babysitter, and, you know, we'll go out. And um, so... Um, we went and and I went up to the showroom and I said uh, I said Lala Frank Sinatra is here I want to see this show 
And so we walked up to the major d' and I gave my name, <laughs> and he, oh, Mr. Mastrangelo. So he, he, uh, he, he ushered us in, and um, we were walking towards the stage, mm -hmm. closer and closer. Yeah. And are you thinking, I'm thinking is there a mistake? Or, yeah. Or how much do I have to give him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we walked past the front row. Wow. We went on on the wings of the stage. Wow. Um, I haven't been in I haven't been in the showroom at Caesars in in a long time, so I don't know what it looks like now. But at the time, um, there were the wings of the stage were like a horseshoe. They would come out huh. kind of like this, and there were tables. There were four tables, two on each side, hmm. on the wings of the stage. Wow. And we had one of those tables, and uh, he uh, he asked me to join him after the show was over with. His routine was after the after his second show, mm -hmm. he would go over to the to the uh, baccarat lounge, okay, and that's where he would hold court. Huh. And uh, there would be a cross section of humanity there in that room with okay. him. There was entertainers, politicians, there was uh, uh, um, wise guys, uh -huh. <laughs> and. You know, there were priests and, and just a cross section. Everybody was in there. Now, did you feel at all like, hmm, is this a wise decision, or was it like, okay, I'm, I'm in? I didn't see any problem with it at all. I mean, who was the sheriff then? The sheriff at that time, I think it was. This would have been 1978, 79. So was that Bill Bill Young? No, 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 no. Way before that, 1978 oh. or 79. Oh, okay. That would have been. Uh, um, that that might have been Ralph Lamb, okay. or it might have been John Moran, Senior. John okay. Moran. Um, but uh, by the way, um, well, he told his stat his security people mm -hmm. um, to let me come backstage anytime I was there, anytime I wow. wanted to. So I had an open invitation wow. to go backstage. I saw that show from backstage, maybe. Uh, Fourteen times. Wow! Wow! And um, it was it was something to behold because uh, just watching him and the way he took command mm. of, of of an audience and the material that he was delivering um, it was it was quite an education. But as I said, I, at that time I didn't even think so you about singing at all. I wasn't singing in your all. car or shower or whatever. Yeah, that's just, right. Just casual. Just for enjoyment. Otherwise, maybe it's a good thing because I would have asked him a thousand questions wow. about singing. <laughs> Instead, we talked about other things. We uh -huh. talked about sports. We talked about politics. We talked about the hotels in town. Uh -huh. And um, at that particular time, the time that that I was discussing those things with him, he had he had an interest in the doom. Not an interest. Uh, I misspoke. Not a financial. He was. He, he was interested in a possible ah. acquisition of okay. the dunes. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we kind of Is this about. after Calneva for him then? This would have been after Calneva. Okay. Yeah. So this would have been his second time. Yes. This was um, leading up to the time when he actually had his licensing hearing for um, being um, in the entertainment um, part of, of Caesars. I see. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he was counting in the early employee. 60s or mid-60s when Kennedy was alive. Mm -hmm. was, he was counting in. Yeah. Okay. So that, you seem to remember it very vividly. So that had a big impact. Oh, it did. It did. I mean, an event like that is so... What's so your rare. favorite Frank Sinatra song? If you oh. had to choose one. Oh, if I, had I know that there's 20, but what if you just had to choose one? You know, somebody asked Steve Lawrence that question once. What's your favorite song that you ever recorded or sang? And he said that it's like asking that question is like trying to pick your favorite child. I think Jack Jones said that too. Yeah, probably, probably. It's uh, two weeks ago, or what was that? And that was last week. Yes, yes, correct. Okay, so which one do you find your mind going to? Like when you're not paying attention. Well, there's just so many. There's several that I that, that I just 
Okay, so it's like a Nelson Sardelli moment. There's a million people watching the show. Name three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, there's the song is you. I like that a lot. Um, I like uh, a lot of the songs by Rodgers and Hart. Um, and and we do themes where I perform currently. We mm -hmm. we have themes every every Sunday, and uh, the themes will will be frequently they'll be composer a, com a, a I see. particular sure. composer. Um, sometimes we'll have a, a singer, like we, we've done Tony Bennett, okay. we've done Nat King Cole, okay. and of course we've done Sinatra. Uh -huh. but Does Vince Falcone ever get involved? Vinny was there a couple of weeks ago. Vinny this is at the Tuscany, right? Yes. Okay. He, he just came in to visit, and uh, we coaxed him a little bit, and he got up and wow. played. He, he got up and played the uh, keyboard, and uh, I got to sing a couple of songs with Vinny. And, uh, and uh, that's a, that's always a treat. Okay, so now Nick, let's talk about what was the what, what was the instant that got you to say, okay, I'm going to try this or I'm going to do it. Well, I used to, like I said, the music was always in me, and I always enjoyed it. I always enjoyed live music, um, and I used to follow and still do, as a matter of fact, uh, a fellow named Joe Darrow. Oh yeah. Uh, Joe is a he's at the club fine fine musician mm -hmm. keyboard player and he's he's an, a wonderful singer and uh, I used to enjoy going to various places and hearing him sing and the type of uh, gigs that he would do were frequently open mic oh. so people would come up he'd invite people to come up um, and sort of like karaoke karaoke well. It's different it's than karaoke. It's live. It's yeah. a live band. It's yeah. live music. And uh, I used to request songs of him hmm. for him to sing. And um, I think he we liked the same kind of songs. And uh, he would ask me frequently, "Why don't you come up and sing a song?" And I said, "Well, I can't sing. You know, I, I don't. I'm not a trained singer." And um, Finally, after several such uh, requests or suggestions on Joe's behalf, I, I got up and sang one night. Um, I'd had enough to drink that mm -hmm. I, I was not quite as intimidated about yeah, sure. it. So um, I got up and sang, and uh, uh, I, I saw that I could do it. I mean, I probably did a horrible job. <laughs> but you felt great. But I felt great doing it, and and and, um, and everybody responded positively. Yes, because that would have probably yeah. in the end, right? Yeah. If it was good positive. point, That's a good point. Okay. Where was that? It was at Nora's. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it was at Nora's because okay. Joe was there for many, many years, and uh, same uh, place they have it still, right up in the corner in the front. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, what it's year was that? It's expanded since then. Yeah, I understand. They took another part or something. Another two parts. Oh, two parts. Wow. Yeah. It must have been really good. I, I think they expanded on either side of the original okay. part of the restaurant. Yeah, I can see that. So, uh, what year was that? Oh, I'm thinking that would have been right around the end of the millennium. Okay. I'm saying 1998, 99, okay. something like that. And then what happened? Because your singing is, is continues to increase yes. according to the Duke. Yes. Um, I just needed to... I didn't ha ever have any formal training hmm. in singing. When I was young, I did have uh, I did take violin lessons. Oh. For how and, long? Oh, it was about a, a year, okay. year and a half. So you could read music at that time? Yes, with difficulty, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't pursue it because I was too interested in sports okay. and, and, and things like that at the time. Did you play baseball? I played baseball. Shortstop, second base? I, I, I wrestled. Oh. And um, 
I used to, I swam. I've always been a swimmer. Oh. And uh, that's how I get my exercise. That's my preferred way of getting exercise. Okay. But, um, yeah, I didn't keep that up. Uh, and I had a little bit, a few months of drum lessons as well. Okay. And, um, but since I'd never had any formal singing right. training, um, I just, I decided to, uh, to, to, to try to do it as best as I could. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's kind of my personality type. I'm very goal oriented. Okay. I said, uh, you know, now I'm going to commit myself to this. Okay. I'm going to make sure that I, at least I learn, mm -hmm. and I make the best use of what I've got, you know, my my voice and uh, my sense of timing and, and, and things. Well, like I that. haven't seen you perform, but everybody I've talked to says you're you're great. <laughs> well, that's music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I do. I, I am dedicated. And, and, and they might say it that way because you are a practicing professional attorney who was with the DA's office. So, that, I mean, that's a real attorney. You had a big caseload, I'm sure, when you were at the DA's office. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're uh, a real attorney. And so for somebody who's a singer to say you are a good singer, to me, that's a lot different than somebody who spent their life trying to be a good singer. But my goal is to be a good singer in its own right, mm -hmm. um, not to be an attorney who, an can, attorney sing. who can sing. Yeah. Um, I want to. Well, be that's a, what I've heard about you is that you are a good singer. Well, I I am learning. <laughs> I am <laughs> still in it, the process. How of is it when you get with other singers? Do you is it like well, don't tell, give the guy tips? Is it like in golf, well, you know, don't don't start telling people how to do it. Or do people say, you know, why don't you try this? Um, you know, Bob Anderson came in, um, and uh, one of the, you know, one of the things it wasn't necessarily about singing technique, mm -hmm. as it was the sound system and how oh. to, you know. I think he's kind of fanatical about about sound. I could I could see that. Why? And he. Um, he he wanted to EQ the the uh, oh, the head right. on the uh, PA system um, to to fit my my voice, oh. you know. And, and how did it turn out? It turned out great. He was right. Okay, he was right. But as far as tips go, um, every once in a while somebody will ask me, you know, how do you do this? Or uh, or they they'll say, you tips. well. Not really. Yeah. Is that professional singers don't give each other tips? Not unless they're asked. Okay. That's the etiquette. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's the etiquette, but that's that's How kind of the custom and practice. Okay. I would say that. Okay. Okay. Um, at least that's been my experience. You mentioned Bob Anderson. What yeah. do you think of his show? Oh, I think it's great. Frank's show. I think it's great. And um, I have kind of a uh, unique perspective on it because like I said I, I saw sure. Frank's show yeah. from backstage so many times um, and the way that they've set it up um, it, it, it's it's very very authentic yeah um, there is a segment in the show you see most of the show is, is a recreation of a concert that's the majority of the yeah, show. Yeah. There's a segment in the show where they take you um, to another place. They take you to a recording studio. Right. And and uh, that's interesting, and, and that's probably very authentic. I never saw him in a recording studio. but Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But, that's uh, where uh, Vinnie Falcone says to the band, give me an A. Yeah. Everybody says, A. Yeah, right, right. Um there was a lot of joking around, as I understand it. And it seems like there was a lot of drinking, too. <laughs> yes, I would imagine. Um, backstage, um, when, when I would see his shows, there was a long table, and they would have pizza at either end of the table. And huh. in the middle of the table was Jack Daniels. Okay. Of course, you could get anything else to drink that right. you wanted that to. Was... So Vinny told me when he was recording with Frank, 
that it was not uncommon for Frank to say, you know, they'd say, well, let's do it again. He'd say, no, that's the best I can do. That, well, that was not uncommon at all. The word on, on, on Frank was that um, he he would try to get it the first time or the second time, but he, he wasn't one to keep. Wouldn't spend eight hours. No, 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 no. Um, and it worked. And it worked. Now, today, would that work? Ah, today, things have changed so much. Okay. Um, so, like, when Tony Bennett is doing something, is it days on one song? Would oh, you guess? I don't think so. Okay, because he knows the material. I don't think so. And the way that they record, if you have a big band, mm -hmm. the way they record now is that uh, you're not recording yourself singing at the same time that the oh, band yeah, right. is playing. Okay. So... So back then they did. So it's just like on the, on the show. Yes, it's just like... Okay, I, see, I didn't get that part of it. I thought it was that was just kind of a, an example to be for the show. No, no, they, they had the live band playing... While he's singing. While he's recording, yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that would make editing kind of tough. Separate the tracks out. Yes. Can't but, separate, I guess. And then and technology was just starting to explode. Mm -hmm. Um, when he went to Capitol, that's when, you know, you had the high, fi high fidelity sound, stereo, and then when he left Capitol and, and, and he went to his own label, which was Reprise, yeah. um, that's when, uh, you know, a lot of devel developments began in the recording equipment itself and, and it was uh, and now it's it's just things change right. from month to month and do you have a recording studio in your house like a little computer thing I don't okay I don't have a recording studio in my house um, do my, you do any recording or you just do live I just do live I've been I've been asked to do some recording um, and I've thought about it and uh, for some reason, the process is kind of intimidating to me hmm. because it's so permanent. Yeah, well, I would think, you know, for your grandchildren, you should do it. I probably will. Yeah, you know, when they get to be your age, that's something that they would really like to have. I probably will. I probably will do that. I have a pair of shoes for my grandfather. That's all I have. <laughs> so, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I would think that would be something very cool. That cane is my grandfather's. Wow. That's a, that, that was carved in Abruzzo. Hmm. So this is, did, did he a eat a cane stick. or what? No. He just did something from back home? Yeah. Huh. Wow. Well, that's, that's really real. Yeah, you can see all the, the work in it. It's right here. How did you end up with that? Um, I brought it back from my grandfather. My dad saw it, and I could see in his eyes that he he really loved it. Mm. And so, when my grandfather passed away, I made sure that that went to my dad. Oh, and uh, now it's passed down to me. Back, right? Because it was you gave it to your grandfather. Yeah, I bought it. I oh. bought it in Italy for okay. my grandfather. Right. So good. Well, that's great. And how many boys do you have? I have four daughters. Four daughters. I have five daughters. And one son. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I have one so grandson. Far. I say so far. One grandson. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So. And is he here? Are all of your four daughters here? No. One of my daughters lives in Philadelphia. Huh. Um. Her husband, a few years back, he got um, transferred. He got a promotion from Las Vegas. His Las Vegas office transferred him to uh, Dover, which is where he works. Dover is in uh, is in um, um, not Maryland. Dover is in Del uh, Delaware. Yeah, I think it's Del Delaware. Yeah. And but it's a short commute to Philadelphia. I see. And so they live in in Philly, and he just commutes to work. Oh, okay. And the other three daughters are here. The other three daughters. And is your here. grandson there or here? My grandson is here. Okay. And also, I have 
part of my family, the Mastrangelo family, mm -hmm. um, has ties to, to Philadelphia. And uh, as a matter of fact, there was in South Philly, there, there was a pretty famous little bakery called mm -hmm. Mastrangelo's Bakery oh, okay. in South Philly. Yeah, I have cousins in Philadelphia also that are from the same town in Italy, Abruzzo, or, uh, uh, their name is Ventresca. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I guess that happens a lot, right? People from one part of Italy come over and then they all seem to tend to end up in the same spot. Yeah. Okay, now what brought you to Las Vegas? We kind of skipped over that. Well, I decided that... So you had your law degree. I had my law degree, and I decided that I, I didn't want to stay in Michigan. I didn't want to stay there. Because of the weather? The weather, primarily, and, uh, and I was always attracted to the West. Um, and so I, I didn't even take the Michigan bar. I went to Arizona first okay. and took the Arizona bar. And I practiced in Arizona for um, for about a year and a half. I think that's what Bonaventure did, didn't he? Go to law school in Arizona. I don't know if he went to. You, you're talking about a young one. Oh, that's that's possible. I'm not sure okay. where he went to school, but um, I uh, I I got a job offer in the district attorney's office here. As what a year was that? This would have been 1970. Okay, so everything is starting to really move here then. Yeah, 1978. Okay. And um, um, I took so the bar. You graduated from law school. I graduated from You were a clerk. Uh, I graduated from law school. I went to Arizona. I took the okay. Arizona bar. Okay. Practiced in Arizona for about a year and a half. Then I came up here to work in the district attorney's office. And at the time, the district attorney's office was paying their law clerks a little bit more than the the county attorney, which is the equivalent mm -hmm. in in uh, in Pima County down in Tucson. Mm -hmm. um, the law clerks here were getting paid more than entry level oh. prosecutors okay. there, so uh, uh, that made it attractive. Plus, it was um, a pretty it was a pretty common thing to go right from law clerk to a prosecuting attorney, I assistant see. district attorney. And so that's exactly what I did. Now what if it was the public defender's office? Would you have done it? As a matter of fact, I applied to the public defender's office at the same time that I applied to, to the district attorney's office. And the district attorney's office was the one to offer me the, the oh. clerkship. So. That's why I decided okay. to go there. So you could have been with the public defender's office. I could have been with the public defender's office. As a matter of fact, uh, at that time, I was leaning towards criminal defense huh. at, you know, to, uh, to be my area of practice. And, uh, but after I, I, I kind of saw the other side of it yeah. from the district attorney's office, and it kind of expanded my sure. my horizons and so uh, but I will say this that when I when I left the district attorney's office I, I've never practiced criminal law hmm. in, in private practice right. um, when I left the uh, the district attorney's office I went to work for Richard Bryan uh, who was at that time the Attorney General okay and so I got assigned to the uh, gaming division, ah. which is which is where all the action was. Yeah, and sure. For for the AG's office, it seemed to be a pretty high profile position, and so I I stayed there for about three and a half years before going into pri private practice. Weren't you on the? I think Angela said you're on the gaming control board. Or something. I was assigned because I was in the gaming division of the attorney general's office. Um, I was assigned to the Gaming Control Board as their legal counsel okay. and the Gaming Commission okay. as their legal counsel. Now, there's a rumor that there was a lot of organized crime involved in these casinos. Is that how prevalent was that? This is like, I guess, what was it? When Howard Hughes came in, it started becoming very corporate, right? After that? Yes, yes. Now, before that, 
is the time I'm talking about. Well, oh, before that, I would say that um, that there was that element. Okay. That element was present. Okay. Was all of the casinos that way? They had some affiliation. I'm not sure, but I think that might have been the case, or pretty close to it, maybe most of them. Okay. But that occurred. We're talking about the, the that point in time was before I even moved to to Got Las it. Vegas. Okay. So when you've been here and you were involved with the game control board, it, the big corporations, it was in transition. Yeah. It was. Now, what was the feeling about Harrods? Because he was up in northern. Uh -huh. Nevada. He really dominated up there, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, yeah. Um, the the company just survives to 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 present day. Yeah. Um, always seemed to me to be a pretty well run company. Mm -hmm. So I'm from the Bay Area. So when we would go want to go to Nevada go gambling, we would go to Reno mm -hmm. or Lake Tahoe, mm -hmm. and so that's where Harris was. Yeah. What about Harold's Club? I guess Harold Smith was gone by the time you yeah. got involved. Yeah. So he was. But I used to see their signs all over the highways, <laughs> even down in Arizona when I was living in Arizona. Go to Harold's Club. <laughs> uh, gambling has been great for Nevada. Sure. Right. Oh yeah. And today, what percentage of Nevada's revenue would you say is because of gambling? Oh, I think it's declining. Um, because there's a lot more things to because do. there's a lot more and, and non entertainment stuff well the entertainment stuff uh, you know gaming has kind of relinquished some of its sway mm -hmm. to other forms of entertainment sure um, I think there's uh, that that aspect restaurants and, right. and shows yeah and and uh, Shopping, shopping. Um, is is they, they've all become money. So the people, would you agree? The people come here now, of course, still for the gambling and, and that, but the um, trade shows, huge draw of the forty about forty million people that come here. Yes. And when you have people coming that plan to spend money, then you can that brings restaurants, entertainers. Uh, shopping, everything else follows that. And yes. then the businesses then follow because it's inexpensive to live here and the weather's good. Yes. And I think Nevada's done a good job of of, of making sure that the, uh, the convention business is, yeah. is supported and uh, keeps growing. Uh, for a while there, it looked like it was going to maybe peter out a little bit because some of the major uh, shows, shows were going elsewhere. Yeah, um, it, it's a fine balance. I think you want to keep those shows coming in, right, uh, so that they can make money uh, for the economy, and uh, but you can't take advantage of them to right. the point where they start looking elsewhere. Yeah. And, yeah, and so that's, right. that's a that's a tightrope that they have to walk. Yeah. The to, logical argument would be trade shows should be in Chicago or Dallas because it's the center of the country. Yeah. When they're here, you of course you get a big pull from California, but um, you know, we're in the middle of the desert. You know, this isn't like going from Detroit to Chicago yeah. or Milwaukee. This is you, yeah. you've got to be committed. Yeah, to come here. So, I agree with you. Nevada has done a just an incredible job, and you've been here. What year did you move here? Seventy. I moved here at the beginning of seventy-eight. Okay, and so it must have appeared like things are really happening here. Oh, yeah. or like you look back ten years, like the end of eighty-eight, that ten-year period, huge change. Yes. Ninety-eight to back to eighty-eight, looking back ten years, huge change. Oh yeah. Right. And then 2008, I, 2008, I guess, was kind of the peak, right? Because that's when everything crashed, and now it's maybe a little bit ahead of that. But yeah, um, we had some that's when there were planes we, all over town. We had some ground to make to yeah. make up. Yeah, and how? Uh, what do you think of the uh, law business here? Well, I've always been a sole practitioner, um, and uh, it's. 
that type of practice is not as prevalent hmm. as it was um, when I first started doing I it. I, there's there there are a lot of big firms that have moved into right. town, following all the people, and the medium-sized firms. And I'm on the other end. I've always been on the other yeah. end of that spectrum. Okay. Now, I went to law school in San Diego, and I was recently involved in a media an arbitration thing here. And arbitration in California is you have a judge or somebody who's an arbitrator, and it's sit around talk about it. And then or it can be an attorney. Or an attorney. Yeah. You know, I, it's something. When I was going to law school, there were a lot of ex-judges that were getting into arbitration. Mm -hmm. And it was, what's your side? What's your side? Okay, you leave the room, you stay. Mm -hmm. Now, the arbitration I went into was more like small claims court in California, where the attorney is acting like the judge. Mm -hmm. is well, that, was that just my experience? Well, what you're describing about... Uh, this was like talking mandatory side, arbitration. Talking to each yeah. side. That's that's more of a mediation type of format okay. than it is an arbitration. An arbitration is like an informal trial. Yeah. It's um, it, it's you you present evidence. Um, you you present briefs. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to conduct discovery in advance of the hearing. Yeah. Um, and the arbitrator makes a ruling. Okay. So it must have been that San Diego was an anomaly because their mediation was the mediator was a facilitator. Yes. Trying to get both sides to work it out. That's pretty much what happens here in, the, in mediation. And, yeah. Now, then the arbitration there was somebody was going to say, look, I'm a judge or I'm an attorney. I think this is how this is going to go. Like you say, you leave, you stay. Hey, Ed, um, you know, I, I think you should consider this. Yeah. And it would be much more um, forceful than than mediation. Mm, right. Well, and, yeah, that's that's not typical yeah. for here yeah. for an arbitration. I see. An arbitration okay. is is a little more structured. Well, and you don't that. have small claims court here, right? Yes, we do. Oh, we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, because what I was told is everything under $7,500 goes to arbitration. No, no. Um, it, the um, Nevada has, well, let me say this, Clark County, mm -hmm. by Nevada law, Clark County, Washoe County, they, they have what's called mandatory non-binding okay. arbitration, um, which means that if you have a case where the amount in controversy is under a certain amount, yeah. I believe it's still 50000 mm -hmm. um, If the amount in controversy is under that amount, you automatically go into the mandatory but non-binding arbitration. Huh. And, uh, but um, that, there are exceptions. Okay. Is it non-binding on both parties, like the plaintiff? It's non-binding on both parties. Okay. Either party can appeal huh. from that arbitrator's decision okay. in that program. Okay. Got it. And then there are separate rules that, that apply to if you've got a contract that requires arbitration, for example. Yeah. That's okay. an example. It doesn't matter what the amount in controversy is, um, you're, you're pretty much going to go to arbitration. Okay. And uh, and that arbitrator's decision is binding. It's okay. final and okay. binding. Okay. And there's very limited grounds for appeal of that decision. Okay. Just like in a court, probably, right? Same reason for appeal. Well, even less so. Less. Okay. Even huh. less. Okay. Uh, there's less grounds that that allow you to appeal. Okay. So would you say the court system has changed a lot since you've been here? Yes. Just because more people have to get more sophisticated? Because there's more people, because um, the, the, the procedure, as far as litigation yeah. goes, mm -hmm. the court system, 
um, the procedures have expanded and um, because when I first got here there was no there was no kind of uh, oversight hmm. if you will of or the very little in the way of oversight for the discovery process and, oh, and how long it was going to take and and you know what you can do and what you can't okay. do in discovery and things like that there, there was uh, less oversight and uh, the judge usually would make a final decision uh, on okay on matters like that but now there are deadlines mm -hmm. that have been uh, imposed and uh, and that makes it a little more rigid I think they had to become more rigid because the other way was was a little bit too too lax mm -hmm. sure and the end result of that was that cases would be in litigation for years right um, yeah, and there was no hurry to, for anybody to do anything, yeah. you know. Now, what about the Supreme Court? Is that functioning well now, or starting to function well? Well, I believe it does, and I think that the appellate. I don't mean the Supreme Court. I always say the Supreme Court. I meant the appellate. Court. The appellate court. Yeah. What I was going to say is, I think that the Supreme Court is is a lot of the load has been, the burden mm -hmm. has been taken. Some of the burden has been taken off because of the appellate court and that's going to overall that's going to improve the system and the quality of justice and the length of time that it takes to get finality yeah in cases right. okay and what about this idea of night court oh I haven't heard very much about that I haven't thought about it um, I think that I think that as long as you can make it so that it's economically mm -hmm. helpful, in other words, enough, uh, that you're not busting the budget by imposing a, a longer hours. I, mean, yeah. I, I think that from an economic standpoint, <clears throat> as long as you can justify it and make it so that it's economical, um, I don't see any problem with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I haven't heard anybody complaining about you can't get to trial quick anymore. Oh, it's there's still problems. Are there? Yeah, there are. And just not as bad. Not as bad. Okay, exactly right. We're catching up. Yeah. I is hope this so. is this the wild wild west out here? No. Okay, it's sophisticated now. There's a law school here now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that um, it was a little bit that way, Wild West, when I first started, when I first started practicing. But it was really a new city. It was a new city, and uh, uh, but on the other hand, it seemed like it was a lot more cordial. Okay. Collegial. It, yeah, collegial, and. Um, when I, when I was in the DA's office and soon after when I left um, I knew all of the judges sure and I got to appear before all of the judges okay. and uh, and for the most part they were excellent legal minds mm -hmm. they were people excellent. who worked their way into a judgeship yeah Not but they, they were always elected uh, district court judges and justices yeah. of the peace were, were always but elected. I mean they were seasoned guys they were seasoned guys. And, Not people who were two years out of law school running. And because everybody knew everybody, um, I, I think that by and large it, it, it was a factor that that, that, that enhanced fairness. Oh. You, do, you, would, you didn't want to be unfair to someone that you were going to encounter time after time right. after time. Sure. So you tried to be as fair as you could. Mm. Um, now there's a little, it's a little more impersonal, and that may have benefits. Um, you don't want favoritism, right? You don't want that, but yeah. but you you do want to have um, a judge that's, that's going to listen to both yeah. sides, right? You want a good working relationship, yeah, just good. like anything else. Exactly. Now uh, you're at the Tuscany. 
I'm at the Tuscany every and Sunday. Every Sunday. And we've, for how long have you been there? We've been there for like 20 months now. Wow. Okay. So that's impressive. I haven't ever been to the Tuscany. The Duke says it is just fantastic. He said it's just a very nice, comfortable. Um, he had dinner there. He said a great price. Yes. You Excellent like the restaurant. Show. Yeah. They're, the, the restaurants in the Tuscany are very good. And the gourmet restaurant, which is right across. By the way, there's two there's two venues for live music huh. in the Tuscany. Huh. There's uh, the Tea Spot Lounge. Well, now it's called the Copa Room. Copa Room. That's where you perform. Right? No, oh. I perform in the Piazza Lounge. Oh, the Rat Pack is in the Copa. The Rat Pack is in the Copa. Got it. Okay. And uh, I'm more on the hotel side. I kind of like the room that I'm in. It's very comfortable. How big is it? Oh. How, compared to the club, the lounge and the club. Oh, larger, it's, right? It's larger. Yeah. Yeah, it's larger. And there's a dance floor. Ah. And um, it's um, it's warm. It's a warm place. There's, hmm. a, there's a fireplace in there, and, and, and uh, it's a nice-looking room. What there's time are you be there? There's, Sunday? I'm there from 7 to 11. Okay. I will, oh, I won't be there this Sunday because we're laying out the magazine this Sunday. I'll be there next Sunday. Okay. And see the show. Not sure what the theme will be. Okay. But, uh, when do you decide? Usually the on Monday after the previous show. Sometimes I sometimes I have them lined up like two or three weeks in, in mm -hmm. advance. Um, but usually, um, and one of the things that I try to do is it's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I don't like to repeat songs. Hmm. I have the ability. You mean repeat them what? From week to week. Okay. So ne ne this show is not going to be the same next week. Oh, definitely not. Okay. That's the reason. Well, the, the, the fact that we have themes, a different theme. Sure. Every Sunday, you that, can't sing my way every yeah, week. Yeah, that helps. Otherwise, you get into a rut and, and you know, you're trying to think of what song should I sing next, and the same songs keep cropping okay. up. Okay. So Do you it, have a signature song? No. Okay. No. It, the, Have you written any songs? Sort of. Sort of. Okay. Do you perform those? Um, there are alternate lyrics that I have that I have composed for songs. Huh. And on occasion, I've, I've sung those. Um, but as far as songwriting goes, I'd like to be able to do it. But... I have such admiration for the composers hmm. whose work that I perform that I just don't feel that I could come anywhere near composing songs of that quality. I see. So I'd rather I'd rather stress the quality and and sing a great song than sing a song just because I've written it. I see. It. Um, so that's kind of the way I approach that. Uh huh. Okay, interesting. And how many, what do you have, a keyboard person with you or what? We have a trio. Trio, okay. I have, in my opinion, the best band in town. Good. I have the best rhythm section in town. Um, I should, probably shouldn't say that because there's some there's some marvelous musicians out there. But mm -hmm. the mus musicians that I work with um, are, we're, we're probably very, very comfortable together. Yeah, I think you I would can, think that would be a big part of it. That's a big part of it, especially if you're. They're the best f for me. Okay. Let me put it that way. Sure. They're the best for me. They and know me. So who who are they? Joey Singer. Okay. Is my keyboard player. He's, uh, and all three of these fellows have been with me since the beginning. Okay. Twenty months ago, and uh, Bob Sachs is a bass player. And Bob Sachs is also the bass player for Bob Anderson's band. Okay, I, I was going to say, I think I've heard that name somewhere. Yes, and okay. Joey Singer is the keyboard. So he works six days a week then? Yeah. Because Bob is Monday through Sunday, what, Tuesday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. And Joey Singer is the, the associate conductor and keyboard player for Showstoppers. Where's that? I'm not familiar with That's that. the show that's at the Palazzo oh. at the Wynn. The Palazzo Theater at the Wynn. Okay. Um, 
that's and both both of the bands were. I was so happy to see big bands coming back. The uh, Bob Anderson's band, of course, sure. thirty one pieces. Yeah, Showstoppers is thirty one. Wow, thirty one pieces. And um, and my drummer Mike Meacham, um, he's at the Tuscany every night. Hmm. He works seven nights a week. Wow, at the Tuscany, and it, including the Rat Pack show. You know, okay. he, he's a, a drummer in the Rat Pack show. And um, it's just wonderful working with these guys. They're, they're so talented. They're, they're just wonderful musicians, and it makes yeah. it a joy. And I guess, you know, when we were doing the shows with Vinny, the in Vino Veritas with Vinny, listening to Nelson, Pete Barbuti, Vinny talking about stuff, it was like they would try to do something every night. Yes. Because I guess they enjoy doing what they're doing, right? Oh, yeah. You have to have a passion for it. In order to be good at it, you have yeah. to have a passion for it. And that's what ho I'm hoping will carry me through and, and help me to keep learning mm. because that's part of the excitement for me is um, is learning. learning. How many like songs that. do you think you know? About 425. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, if you had to sing them without music, would you would you be able to do write down all four twenty five now, without any musical help? You mean, I I couldn't do the musical no notation. Not the notes, but, but just the write the down lyric, the words. The lyrics. Yeah. Yes. Really. Okay. Sure. So then you would know more if you had music to help you. Like you hear a, a melody and it triggers the words in your mind. Hmm. No, you don't do that. No. You just know the words, independent I just know of the, the music. Words. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So no wonder I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is that um, I don't myself. I think it's too hard to sell a song if you're reading it. You know, if you've got the the music. Yeah. And and you're trying to read. Right. It, then that's like karaoke. It's too it's too hard to yeah. to sell the song. You have to know the song, and know what it means, and and be thinking about the lyric and and like the story behind it. It's it's like an actor. Okay. It's like an actor if he if he knows the his lines. Right. You don't you never see an actor in a movie where he's reading the script. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I think a singer is in the same I, situation. See, I wasn't really thinking that you're reading it there. I'm just, I was just thinking, like, for me, songs I hear on the radio, I don't really know the song, but I know mm -hmm. words to the song, but I only remember the words to the song because of the melody. Yeah, well. If somebody said, what are the words to, you know, this song? If there was no music and they said, well, blah, 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 I, I couldn't remember it without mm -hmm. music. But I, again, that's the difference. Yeah. If you need, if you're going to sing a song, it's like being an actor. You have to know the words. Yeah. And um, let's see, George. What's his name? George. He was at the Riviera. He's at the Bootlegger. George. Um, I interviewed him. Starts with a B. George. Bugatti. Bugatti. He told me when he's singing on the interview we did with him, he said when he's singing, he has a story. In his mind, that gives him the emotion. Yeah, that's that's part of it, I think. Yeah, I mean, he had a term for it. I don't remember what it was, but uh, mm -hmm. just uh, yeah, again, just to give him the emotion of that song. Sure. So now, is there anything I, I missed that you want to talk about? Well, um, even though I am devoted. To singing, mm -hmm. I am also devoted to my family, and um, and also my family. You know, my family is the world. So that's me. part of your Italian roots. That that is very very much associated with Italian heritage. Yeah. Yes, yes, and. I am also devoted to my law practice. Uh, people are getting the impression now because they, they, they see my name out there and they see I'm on the, I'm on the marquee now yeah. at the at the uh, oh, Tuscany. Really? Okay. And the um, the electronic billboard, I think they call it. Okay. Um, that maybe I'm retired. I haven't retired 
um, I'm still devoted to my law practice and, and to the clients that I have. And uh, it's kind of, it's a question of balance. Mm -hmm. You have to have balance. You have to have your sure. family. You have to be able to take care of them. You have to have your profession. And if you have more than one profession, then it's, right. So there are three things there that you have to Sure. Do. Now, what uh, type of law practice do you have? Is it involved in gaming? I do some gaming work. Um, I was on the compliance committee for the Riviera Hotel hmm. for 25 years. Wow. And as you know, the Riviera has closed yeah. earlier this year. And uh, But I still do other types of gaming work. Okay. Um, and uh, I do general business practice, contracts, contracts corporate. I do some business litigation, um, and I also do. I when I first started my practice, I did a lot of personal injury work. Okay, and I still do it if I like the case. I'll still do a personal injury case, um, but uh, I don't want to be a jack of all trades. Right. Sure. But those are the areas right there: business uh -huh. law, um, gaming, which is related to the business law, and uh, and personal injury. That's that's pretty much what I do. Hmm. No entertainment law? Well, again, if you look at business law in, yeah. in the broader right. well, context, sure. um, I do review contracts and uh, I, I, I do some, I've been doing more and more entertainment law. At what stage does somebody who's going to perform need to have an attorney representing? Like if they're going to do it at the Venetian, do they need, they're going to be performing at the Venetian? Do they oh. just accept the contract the Venetian gives them, or do they generally say, well, i got to give this to my attorney? It depends on their circumstances. A lot of times, the newer performers, mm -hmm. entertainers, they're so anxious to land that first big job that they don't want to jeopardize it, so no. they don't, they don't Take it. nitpick. But um, as you become more and more... Uh, established mm -hmm. in the entertainment field, then that's when things start to get a little more particular, mm -hmm. and you you insist on certain things, that certain things be in your contract, and sure. it's a process of negotiation, just like it would be in any other business. Yeah, well, I would think, sitting here in the back seat, that with your singing career, you'd be the ideal guy for an upcoming entertainer. To say, you know, to represent it. And because I've done you, some of that. Yeah. But I mean, it just seems like it would be a good niche to be in. Yeah. Because um, it also would keep you in the music game in a different way. Yes. You know. Yes. So, well, I any other things that you want to talk about? Oh, I think we've touched on. Okay. I have one, one last one. question. Yes. Uh-oh. Sauce or gravy? I would say salsa. <laughs> yeah, that's the Italian. Way. So, I've been when you were growing up. What was it? I've been to Italy. Yeah, they don't understand great. Thirty people. times. Okay, they I've don't understand great. I've been to every part of Italy. I've been there, like I said, thirty times, and um, and so if 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 a term if a term has to do with something Italian, mm -hmm. I tend to go to the Italian, the original language okay. first. So, but when you were growing up, sauce. What was it? Okay, in it Detroit, was sauce. sauce. Yeah, it was sauce. Okay, yeah. So same for me. Yeah. Not sugo. Well, sugo is Italian. Yeah. That's what the guys from Sicily that I interview they generally say sugo or and gravy. It, and in other parts of Italy, you could yeah. say sugo because that's that is Italian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but most of them, the you know the people here that are Italians, in the restaurant industry, it's always sauce. Yeah. yeah. And they just laugh when you say gravy. Which is also a form of Latin music. Correct. It is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Nick, thank you very much for taking the time. This was very uh, fun, informative. Um, you know, this will go down as one of the one of the really good informative ones. I'm glad I had the lot. opportunity to do this.